I'm Wesley Lane, Professor of Transcultural Arts and Design from the School of Art, Architecture and Design and the Director of Creature. Welcome you all on board. As part of a research series of performance, monuments and public spaces, today's event is initiated from one of Creature's research strengths, Public Face, organised and coordinated by Dr. Yatset Lewis Scarsell. In the past months, we had two engaging seminars, one on revisiting counter monuments by Dr. Ruth Fasakli at the University of South Australia and Festival Cities by our colleague Margaret Gold. The last session in this series is coming up in the next couple of weeks. You can find its detailed and the full program on Creature website. Dr. Scarsell is a reader in arts and performance at the School of Art, Architecture and Design, also Creature's deputy <coughs> director. I'd like to pass on to Dr. Scarsell to introduce the research series and most of all, our invited speaker who joined us today from Chicago. Thank you for taking part in our event, Dr. Mitted Rittridge, and a warm welcome to you. Now, without further ado, over to you now, Yakset. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and uh, we're, I'm really, very excited today with this talk, which is completely international because uh, we'll be live from Chicago uh, with, uh, with uh, Dr. Mechel Wiedrich. And then we'll also be live from Grenoble with uh, Francesca Filatondi. Uh, so the uh, this evening is made of two parts in the first part and we've got um, uh, Mechtel as a very special guest and who's going to uh, talk to us about her research since her publication performative monuments um, so I'm going to read uh, a little bit uh, about um, Mechtel in a second but just to, so to say as well that the, uh, the Mechtel presentation would then be followed by an example of one of our doctoral students Francesca Filatundi who's uh, exploring uh, also uh, so an expanded idea of, of um, the application of performance and in her particular case very very contrasting setting she's applying the concept uh, contemporary performance concepts to the uh, specific case of olympic level uh, artistic swimming which is what francesca does um, in her uh, professional um, work and so we're combining these two completely different ideas of, of performance and performativity. Um, and I think, you know, this is something that's very, very important for this series of events, as um, as Wesi has mentioned, called Performance uh, Monuments and Spaces. Um, so I'm going to read a little bit about uh, Mechtild. And just to say that the, we've got, at the moment, we're having some technical problems with with Francesca's sound, so I hope by the time she's going to present, we'll be able to um, to have so solved all these problems. As we all know, this is always the, the case with uh, with doing remote sessions as we're doing now. So um, I'm going to read a bit about Mechtild Wittrich and who's uh, who researches, writes, and teaches at the intersection of modern and contemporary art and architecture, with a focus on time-based and ephemeral practices in particular performance and art in public space, monuments and questions of the public sphere. Vidrich is Associate Professor of Art History, Theory and Criticism at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, where she's live from just now, and um, uh, reviews editors from, the, from 2019 to, the pre to 2022 for Art Journal. Most of her published work can be found on her academia page. Uh, I'm also delighted that Mechtel also has contributed, contributes to our uh, MA Public Art and Performance uh, program. And, um, and of course, you know, I reached out to Mechtel since her uh, very important publication called Performative Monuments, which for us um, is a, a very important key text in our masters, so I'm so pleased to have Mechtel uh, today to present live to you all. So over to you, Mechtel. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jacek, for the kind invitation and introduction. And let me now see if screen sharing actually works. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's always that that magic if. <laughs> Can everyone see this? Uh, not yet, but it might be uploading. Okay. Yes, I think it's Super. Uh, just a second. Yes, it's now working. Thank you. Excellent. So I dive right in. Really? Um, 
I will dive into my talk with a case study from Chicago. We'll then discuss monument activism and after that artistic reenactment. I would like to see how what I developed as performative monument for the late 20th century can or cannot connect those different engagements with the past we find today. On the 2nd of December 2017, Tsai Guokyang detonated a polychrome mushroom cloud on the roof of Rittenstein Library at the University of Chicago. Some 50 meters from the location of the first controlled nuclear chain reaction 75 years earlier. The pyrotechnic artwork, as the university's news outlet described the event, or colored mushroom cloud, as the artist entitled his sketches and the work, sent an ambiguous message into the sky. As temporary event and towering aerial monument, its dual character could be seen as a concession to the ambivalent outcome of the discovery. A reminder of the pathological hype surrounding the beautiful spectacle of nuclear explosions. Or a spectacular gesture affirming the university's priority in nuclear research. The stable, if not obvious, ambivalence carries over to the fact that Sai's colorful work is perfect for being photographed. The, the event lives on in these images, which in themselves become tools of commemoration, narrative, or activism. These, while circulating both bodily and electronically, from author to paper and from cell phone to cell phone, are neither fully tethered to nor fully disengaged from the South Side Chicago site of the explosion. Just so they allow bodily involvement through imaginative identification with the on-site audience. Most evident, maybe, in the corporeal attachment of smartphones to bodies. As well as a historically distanced spectatorship, interested perhaps in the whole sequence of reception of the Chicago Pile 1 discovery. This reception would include the bronze sculpture commissioned from Henry Moore for the 25th anniversary, which occupies the pavement around which size audience assembled. Or the students lying down during the detonation in a protest performance against nuclear weapons. It is, interac it is the interacting nature of aesthetic representation, sorry, Protest and commemoration in this and many other contemporary works that interests me here, and its thematic and methodological departure from older debates, and old in this case here means 20th century, about memorial culture, performance, and art in public space. Commemoration, activism, and a rapid ramification of accompanying activities across social networks come together with more general issues of spectatorship in this particular instance. But how they do so is paradigmatic of early 21st century art and political struggle. All these parts are relevant if we want to understand the contemporary status of monuments, how contemporary commemoration works, and how it relates to community activism and demands for representation, which ultimately is the public sphere. That social media has become part of where our bodies in physical space interact with others in virtual space complicates any easy analysis of such works on the ground, as well as their audiences and reach. It also complicates what we understand as sight and the expressive and practical role it plays in art and activism. That contemporary commemoration includes an extension of its present tense history through social media, or that artists as well as audiences take this into account is not news. Less well understood, however, is how real-time digital documentation makes possible different levels of engagement, resistance and remediation on the side of production and later in the many layers of reception in various often newly minted public spheres. Some of these are carefully choreographed 
curated social media sites, strategic arrangement of photographs, descriptive or ironic image captions or hashtags. Some might happen in the circulation and redistribution of content and allow for a fair amount of chance. And of course, monuments are already a mediation that reshapes the construction of past events for the present. The theory of performativity and its mediation provides a through line for my thinking, connecting ephemeral, durable and distributed practices. Such interaction, interaction, sorry, interactions should not and do not stop in one particular present moment and a multifaceted public history with all the expected messiness and inconsistencies should not dissuade us to move forward with our inquiries. The current debate about traditional monuments and their removal is helpful in showing the need not just for public commemoration but for history and to emphasize the dependence on public space. History is an essential factor in shaping not just public space in the present, but it is in fact essential in allowing access to a functioning and heterogeneous public sphere. The monument activism of the last years confirms the power of the audience of monuments in two ways. Monuments are nothing without the audience and they can be activated at different times. Almost anything can become a marker of activation, confirming that it is not the object or its form where the agency, agency lies, but the interaction. But the object and its connotations, materials, its forms and connections to traditions and modes of circulation will influence how the interaction can play out. Presence in public space is important for a democratic public sphere to reflect on and be part of history and society. In what follows, I will try to bring together ephemeral events such as the monument by Sai, then the activism around traditional monuments, which, even though it goes against the original intention of the monument, is very much an activation. And in fact, the one activation we need for a democratic and healthy public sphere in the 21st century. And then artistic practice that reenacts former avant-garde. Ultimately, I believe, this is the take home sentence for today, that today's activism is the most successful performative monument in the early 21st century. But I also believe that this would not have been possible without the crisis and the cause for change monuments went through in the 20th century. Public commemoration can be a tool for democracy, but also for decolonizing, a difficult procedure that often challenges a democratic society's illusion of its own legitimacy, and especially the illusion of lack of complicity with the wrongs done in its name. But in using commemoration to restitute historical wrong, we need to be aware how much easier it is to celebrate literally put on a pedestal individuals using them as stand-ins for the historical victories and accomplishments. And I'm not excluding ephemeral artistic practice from this because I think that today it has a similar weight than objects in public space. History as a discipline is of course itself often complicit as Linda Tuhi Weiss Smith reminds us in her classic book, Decolonizing Methodologies. We believe, Smith writes, that history is also about justice, that understanding history will enlighten our decisions about the future. Wrong. History is also about power. In fact, history is mostly about power. The reason she gives is that history is the story of the powerful and how everyone else fits into their master plans. If we want to decolonize monuments, not as a self-congratulatory gesture on the part of governments, we will have to rethink both objects and history as direct conduits of power and public space. The link between commemoration and decolonization is first and foremost the concept and reality of sight.
Cameroonian political philosopher Achille Membe has made clear that spatial relations directly impact decolonizing efforts. In discussing the now infamous Rhodes statue depicting British colonialist Cecil John Rhodes, which after protests and defacement was removed from the campus of Cape Town University in Johannesburg in 2015, he asks, what does bringing down the statue of a late 19th century privateer has to do with decolonizing a 21st century university? Or as many have in fact been asking, why are we so addicted to the past? Member leaning on Franz Fanon calls for a rearrangement of spatial relations when he claims, this is the quote here, the decolonization of buildings and of public spaces is inseparable from the democratization of access. He discusses access to public space and the way in which spatial relations show historical power relations and how history itself becomes visible in these relations. The main question in this and many cases around the world is similar. What markers such as monuments should lead the audience to a shared history? The South African discussion is important for issues of representation and marginalization in public space and a call for a right to history. This is, encompasses the right to use public space, space, but also the right to have diverse histories represented in it. Monuments and memorials mark territory in order to be part of the construction of history. Their simple existence as part of the cityscape or landscape gives them power. Similarly, the presence and visibility of marginalized parts of the population is a necessary prerequisite ensuring that these can become part of the public sphere at the moment of their presence. Not only because they are there, but because they are part of the discourse. Representation is where those two concepts meet. Art may visualize a counter history or include marginalized groups via the power of representation. In my first book, Performative Monuments, I was particularly drawn to the puzzle of how the most ephemeral and permanent modes of art making came together in addressing the challenges of post-war commemoration. Along the way, I acknowledged but could not explore in full theoretical depth uh, the trend to repetition and reenactment in contemporary art in the new millennium which is a particularly effective way to link new or emergent artworks to the long durée of history. Artistic and political reenactment also connects back and for all its claim to immediacy, points precisely to the discrepancy between then and now, to changed contexts, physical and political. Reperformances in particular tend to monum monumentalize that which is being restaged with disorienting consequences for the increasing proportion of ambitious political art that in some way aims at appropriation, at appropriating or reactivate the past under the rubric of the re. Size color mushroom can very well also be seen in this register, reenacting and reimagining nuclear energy. And the protesting students were, of course, reenacting the catastrophic consequences of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings at the end of World War II. If we can theorize reenactment as the staging of the historical, it took some theorizing to apply it to life art which used to be defined as one-time encounter between artist and audience. A project by British artist Carrie Young shows how the context of performance in urban or rural places of the 1970s can be opened up to today's global reality. Against the dusty sky, cranes and high rises loom in the distance. In the middle ground, amidst desert clumps of grass, a short-haired woman in a gray pantsuit walks atop a heap of what looks like discarded concrete paving. Her arms 
point outward, her eyes point down to her feet, as if she is working to maintain balance atop the rubble. The title of the photograph makes explicit an art historical allusion, body techniques after a line in Ireland, Richard Long, 1974. It is one of Young's 2007 set of eight body techniques responding to canonical performances by Miele Ladaman Ukiles, Bruce Nauman, Wally Export, Dennis Oppenheim, and others. Performing in airports and building sites around Dubai and Sharia, Young always cites her source. Urban expansion, use of resources, individual agency, as well as historical consciousness are engendered and explored in the context of performance for the camera. It is fair to ask whether this art artwork unmasks the globalizing process, or if it is just another of its manifestations. Despite its art historical pedigree, body techniques is not so much about appropriation as about repetition and the drawing of distinctions between and within gestures, as we are made aware of historical difference through the performance's new sites. For instance, young mirrors the line in Ireland, which framed the rocky landscape photographically through the modernist notion of a straight edge. But also, perhaps through the monumental line far behind her, which is horizontal, in stark contrast to the one she is restaging. Uh, we are being made aware of the difference. The very title of the series recalls one of its sources, Valley Export's Body Configurations, shot over a decade from 1972 to 1982, with the art artist sometimes before, sometimes behind the camera. Young's body techniques, in fact, recreates one of the latter more closely than she has Long's photograph, only instead of the architecture of Vienna's first district, against which Export's model stretched back, Young slumps forward against the massive step, while enormous white modular panels fence off the building site behind her. Again, the colliding geographies made explicit by title and color film complicate the interpretation of human interpretation of human action in a landscape. Also, Export used this particular sequence of body configurations in her film, Invisible Adversaries, a body snatcher themed feature in which internal and external perception, feminist self-definition, and the role of media consumption and representative architecture play their part in the construction of a patriarchal state system, disabling free individual choice. In the case of export, historicist Vienna, as shot in the 1970s and 80s, stood for a continuation of authoritative patriarchal country culture, relating the stones of 19th century Ringstrasse to fascism and post-war social conformity. Export used space and the camera to illuminate how the architectural environment not only conserves this milieu in its massive forms, but also how these in turn shape our subjectivity through an exaggerated behavior of bodily mimesis of architecture. I discussed her oeuvre and how she later would turn to objects and in fact, to memorials in public space. Her case and others showed the link between performance art and what I call performative monuments, interactive objects that served almost as a prop for the performance of history on the side of the viewer. And here we're seeing on the left side, you're seeing her uh, project, which was not, um, which didn't win Rachel White read one for the Holocaust Memorial in Vienna. And she envisioned that the audience would walk through the tunnel and there would be an audio installation of texts, but there would, would also, also be inscriptions. And one side of the tunnel would be made of glass. And so the commemoration would become extremely public, right? It's like an actual commitment to publicly commemorate the Holocaust. Is all this now extended into a discussion of global economy, labor, 
and their visible effects on the environment. Young's work is no nostalgic recreation of the post-war avant-garde. It allows for the tension between that which is familiar and charting difference in meaning. A very general message maybe, mapping familiar forms into a discourse we first understand as global. We might want to wonder why the specificity of the places she visits is, is so easily conflated with that of familiar artworks and with what preconditioning we are overlooking in the work, being so readily intelligible to an art public. Stone and concrete emerge as materials telling us about human fantasies of expansion and placemaking, about the power to shape the environment and the imagination of particular fitting and behaving bodies in their midst. It is no coincidence that Young considers the professional photographer behind the camera a technician without a static agency in the resulting image, as if the tools used in this experiment had to remain neutral and as if the photograph were not also a material prominent in its objecthood inside gallery spaces all over the world. Young series can be read through the networks and audiences that are constituted by weaving together their various histories and present concerns. But there's yet another narrative that is important, however little Young foregrounds it, namely the tension between human activity manifested in the vast and extensive construction site and the seemingly carefree attitude of the artist turning into an absurd clash of artistic concerns at the brink of postmodernity and current affairs, gender inequality, global capital and authoritarian politics, contracted labor, questions of individual freedom and public space, and humans' aggressive behavior towards the planet and what we call its resources. This also anchors young series in questions of the ecology. If the work is constitutive of an ecological consciousness, in the way Amanda Bertzkes argues for it, in her book Plastic Capitalism remains ambiguous, however, mainly because of the beautifully drafted sublimity of what we can but don't, do not have to read as a space of the capitalist scene. While Young's project engages several of the strategies of performance becoming monumental through its documentation, I elaborated in performative monuments. We see here an even more complex engagement with history in which references to the art historical avant-garde are combined with a critique of, or maybe fascination with, urbanization in new geographical areas and at the same time bump up against challenges by the introduction of the new concept of the Anthropocene and the various critical alternatives offered to it. The 21st century confronts us not only with artistic and popular practices of reenactment, but with a far more widespread fusion of historical investigation and nostalgic identifications. Sai, equally, draws on the images we know, not on the broader applicability of nuclear silence, science or the human toll of atomic bombs. Is the spectacle intended as critique? Even though Sai and Yang show contrasting approaches, intentions and temporalities, there is in all ca both cases a restaging of, of a historical image, iconic, even if only in performance art, in the case of Valley Export. They do not recreate the experience, but allow for the tension between that which seems familiar and the charting difference in the conditions of performance. This is then also the link between artistic reperformance and strategies of commemoration. But what does this mean for our understanding of it? And why do I feel the interaction with the past does not really extend to the present. Maybe the problem is that with the success of performative monuments and the concept of performativity, we now claim that, a perf that performativity is at work in all art or history writing, all art that deals with the past and in all event-based or performance art. What we need maybe rather 
and can get if we pay careful attention to what is preserved, reconstituted, reimagined in such works, is a demonstration of just how much has changed in light of something being the same, at least conceptually and sometimes literally. Ultimately, history itself is never stable, always also imagined and recreated and changed in its endless reception. I do not want to claim that the issue hinges on the bodily presence of the performer or the audience, as both performance and monuments now exist on a range from solid object to performative photographs to an explosion, for example. The body is implied, it seems, also the body of the audience. This part of the success of what was new in the performative monuments 40 or 30 years ago is maybe also the problem. Does it still work? I'm not sure. Beauty, image, spectacle, and an affirmative attitude towards the past might have caught up with these artworks after all. Spatial relations are power relations today, as back then, as Member has said. And I think that at least for the moment, monument activism is the best performative monument we can have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mechtel. You're giving us a, a huge, uh, you know, an incredible range of of, of um, topics to to think about, and um, and it's it's a really uh, really interesting um, area of research that you've um, that you really initiated in this in this sense. And one of the um, of the things that I uh, I was going to get now the uh, the audience to also raise a couple of questions and maybe some. Um, to, to start a little bit of discussion and then we'll do we'll just contain the discussion so that we can move to the next uh, presentation and then we can also go back to this discussion at the end bringing back together um, these two uh, facets of today's um, of today's topic um, but perhaps one of the things I was going to um, to mention is how from the point of view of, of public art for instance how um, uh, how Mechtel's research is so fundamental because it makes us think about this relationship of monumentality and performativity so that we can start to see in the in the monuments both contemporary and traditional the performativity uh, implication but also at the same time it makes us think of the monumentality of of performance and of course these concepts these two concepts have often been seen as almost disparate because a performance couldn't claim to be monumental that's the sort of traditional way of thinking but of course it, it absolutely can be and um, uh, method to what extent do you think that this the idea of performativity has become crucial in thinking of of um of um of almost like an antidote to the various problems that monuments have created in terms of, of course the Black Lives Matter uh, um, uh, uh, movement exposing of course the uh, right exposing uh, the the cultural problems with many of our monuments uh, be them uh, these from colonial um, heritage or federal um, uh, confederate um, heritage etc so to what, to what extent could we see performativity as the key to liberate uh, the discourse of monuments from from this um, these um, these issues. To I, I say liberate, but I mean to deal with the, with the issues and to and to find a future for for um, for this practice. Sorry, I'm muting. <laughs> yes, uh, <laughs> I I think that um, the you know the monuments that are uh, under question now they will never be the same after. The protests because they are performative in a literal sense, right? In the Austinian linguistic sense, that they change the social uh, texture around them. So, um, no matter if they stay or leave public space, I think they will be affected, which is good, obviously, right? <laughs> they um, need to be uh, debated and discussed. And that is probably the power of these. Um, the protest and also how they then travel, of course, into social media via via photographs. I'm not sure this is enough, so I'm not the one who says, let's protest a little bit and have some nice images yes. and then we can go about um, our lives again. I think sometimes then you um, consequences need to follow. And this is maybe even where I changed my opinion a bit because I realize that 
objects are very territorial and even the best performance then has a certain disadvantage in the end. Yes, uh, that's really uh, interesting. I'm just wondering, uh, do people in the audience have a, have a question they might want to ask? I should say that the our chat function tends not to work on these uh, for some reason in these public events. So if you could raise your hand, that would be um, that would be brilliant. Let's see if there's and feel, do feel free, please, to to ask questions. I think people are still absorbing the <laughs> the um, information, and I love your your quote, um, your point that um, that today's activism is uh, the most successful performative monument. In fact, as we wait for maybe um, a couple of questions, do you want to maybe elaborate on that point? Yeah, I mean, you could you could also say I'm a bit maybe disillusioned by artistic practice, um, but I think it is uh, related to to the success of performative practices in the last decades, and at some point it becomes an an obvious and maybe mainstream option for artists. And um, not everything that is a performance is performative, which means for me has an effect in public space, really a social effect. That's, I think, what I'm looking for when we deal with history and the assumption that we are engaging in commemoration, right? Performance can be much more than that, obviously, but my research, right, is about sure. history and public space. And then sometimes I feel um, that the success of these artistic practices and how they're now being recycled sometimes often get in the way. Yes, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Time for something else. Definitely. And to what extent you, you were mentioning before the deal with the mediation of um, uh, the role of mediation and, and of course you point out at the, uh, the for instance, in the Sai Kuo Kiang um, uh, installation, uh, you, of course there, there are so many levels of mediation. We are, uh, that the work itself mediates our, our, our memory of an image. Um, and of course, is then remediated through, um, our, um, of course, through uh, you know iPhones taking an image, then then uh, placing that the same image in in social media. Um, so how how does mediation and remediation then then work in this mon monumentality? Uh, I think that there can be distinct and effective public spheres online. My issue is, you know, I'm not the only one pointing out that. Hashtags are being curated also by companies and algorithms are um, not usually allowing an extremely open idea concept of public, the public sphere. So I see there is potential, but I'm also seeing that particularly young people are extremely naive. You now they think it's an open space while um, it's a company space. Yes. Uh, yeah, allow yeah. For, you know, a certain limited. Uh, conception of, of public sphere, but maybe that can be, you know, pushed. I think some artists are trying to push that. Some pe people try to mess with the hashtags with like the algorithms and that's where it gets interesting, I think. If it's not, I mean, public sphere or public space is never neutral. It's always, you know, also in physical public space already layered with history, gender, race, everything, everything. Yeah. And the same goes for online public space and people just mm -hmm. need to be aware of it. There are rules, it's already set up, it's not neutral. And it, it's interesting because one of the, the subjects that we often talk with my students on the MA Public Art and Performance course is the idea that, uh, that yes, we what often we consider uh, in a public space is not necessarily a formal public sphere because uh, I often give the example, for instance, if there you are in a shopping centre and there's uh, there's an artwork, a beautiful artwork that's, mm -hmm. that's uh, accessible to everybody. Well, of course, it is accessible technically, but the reality is it's, it's accessible so long as you are part of the environment that will buy into the the, 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 the premise of the, the space and in a way I can see your point on, on social media that in fact it, it generates that same that same mechanism it's public but only of course through our data um, and and through the data commerce that, that comes from that yes yes so it's it's exactly as you say and I just think it's very important to 
keep that in mind and also maybe keep pushing the boundaries of access and the supposed neutrality, right? It has to still become much more accessible than it is now. Both the physical public space and the internet. Yes. Thank you so much, Michael. We'll mm -hmm. come back to you. I'm I'm slightly concerned, that just in case I'm not getting, uh, because uh, we we um, have been thinking whether on this um, chat we're able to actually get questions uh, in. So so I hope that people are not raising their hands there. Yes, and I'm not someone, 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 please. Oh yes, okay, okay, okay. One <laughs> second. Thank you very much. Um, right, okay. Hold on. Let me just let me just make sure that I I um, can see who's asking the question. Um, okay, it's yes, John we Keith get a question yesterday. from, thank you, thank you, Matthew. I got a question from John Keith. Thank you, um, John. Hello, Jacek. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I could, I could only see the initials, I couldn't see the name. <laughs> uh, yeah, I just wanted to um, pick up on the point you made about the work of art, let's use that in inverted, in inverted commas, in a supposedly public space and you mentioned a shopping centre for example but it seems to me that there's actually a provocation to be made there which in fact is is any space public in a, in a pure sense it seems to me no it's not because I can go to um, a monument that's in say a national park well of course it's public but it's run by a national in, in the UK context it's run by a public part the National Park Authority and so on I can go to a monument or an exhibition, which in fact I did um, last year when we still had access to these <laughs> things, um, at a National Trust territory up in Norfolk, where it was public, I had to buy a ticket. So one could say, well, how public is that? But it was essentially public. But of course, it's National Trust grounds in a national, uh, of a National Trust house, etc. cetera. Um, I can go to a monument in my local park, which is probably run by the local council, the local authority. So I think the word public actually is a really difficult term, frankly, because we tend to think of it in a quite kind of freely, pure, philosophical, ethical sense. And I dispute that. I would say what therefore is a public space in a way you, your, in your example, gave us a shopping centre. It's a fairly obvious one. It's a limited public space. And so we have to start introducing qualifying terms such as limited and so on. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on this, Mechtil? I think the, the, the debate on what constitutes a public space continue to, to develop all the time. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I think so. In, in my book, I looked at, you know, Bali Export, for example, she comes out of the feminist movement and so mm. You know, the first <laughs> um, uh, conception of limitations in public space uh, about gender and behavior, but also the role architecture and the urban environment plays, you know, mm -hmm. the way architecture looks from traditional public sculpture, which, you know, back then in the 60s was discussed as gender, the males, the naked wom women and the generals and stuff like that. And I think now, um, obviously, with the, the monument, um, protests, um, of course, you know, the racial hierarchies have come come to the forefront and um, they are extremely relevant. And we, I mean, um, I mean, I'm not sure anyone thought that public space, or you know, that public space was completely accessible. I think these debates have been going on at least since the 1960s or even Le Febre and, you know, mm -hmm. these um, people who engaged in radical geography but maybe then we have become complacent a little bit you know 20 years ago I thought mm -hmm. okay now it's getting better and it's becoming gender issues are a bit less obvious now we're realizing how incredibly um, territorialized public space still is with mm -hmm. concepts from the 19th century and racism and sexism and everything Definitely. And I think, you know, it's true <laughs> because often the, the phrase, the, the phrase public sphere is almost a uh, replace public space as if it kind of sorts out the problem. But the problem, of course, as you say, method yeah. and as you point out, John, is, is still uh, is still there. And, and I think in a way, I wonder whether we should think of public space rather than as being the opposite of the private space is more of a sort of continuum of different uh, degrees of, of, of publicness. Yes. Um, there's a better and of course which are then heightened by the performative uh, encounters that we see in them. 
can Thank I? Thank you. Yes. Just on, yeah. on that, and then I'll, I'll, somebody else can step in. But there's an irony there because it seems to me that private is actually more easily defined than public. Mm -hmm. It's on a continuum, I quite agree, but actually the private end is much more easily defined than the public end, seems to me, which is, is, is there are different kinds of public, maybe that's the way I'm putting it, different kinds of public space, mm -hmm. varieties of public space, whereas private, Private has a fence around it. It's private. It's quite actually easily defined in very simplistic terms in a way that I don't think we can with public. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I, you know, in the US, of course, uh, the, the privilege is a big issue. And I think that is also really important because the more privilege, the more you can think of public space or the public sphere as neutral because you have access to <laughs> all all those doors that don't open mm -hmm. for other people. And uh, so I'm not sure I would want to think about different public spheres or public spaces because that sounds like it's if they were compartmentalized and if mm -hmm. we, we just need to start bringing them together. Unfortunately, I think it's it's we need to, you know, really start a discussion about privilege mm -hmm. because, you know, we are in the center of, of power and we have a lot of access. And some people, I mean, they're not physically being removed from public space, but very much through, um, you know, various limit limitations in access. And that's also what, I mean, of course, what is behind the, the monument protests right mm -hmm. now. Thank you very much, Mehfield. And so we're going to jump to the ne to the um, next presentation and come back to try, try and, and draw. The next presentation is going to be very, very contrasting in, in terms of topic. But it, but I think, you know, it's very, uh, first of all, one of the things that we uh, we try to do with our sessions is to also combine, um, you know, established researchers with, with doctoral students so that we can see this sort of the, the different sort of um, the, uh, different sort of ideas of, of research Research and as they develop in particular in different practices um, within our, our school, we champion a lot of the idea of, of, of practice based and practice led research. And so we're very proud to host as one of our uh, PhD students, Francesca Filatundi. I'm just going to give a little introduction to Francesca and Francesca is going to present to us uh, not so much a paper, but more a presentation on her research at the moment. And then we'll come back together to all together back with Mechdel as well to, to kind of bring back some of the of the threads of today's uh, very diverse evening. So, um, just again to 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 say that uh, we continue with the international uh, thread here because Francesca is live from Grenoble um, at the moment, and Francesca is is um, uh, Italian and and works across uh, Europe. Let me just give a couple of, of details on, on her practice. So Francesca Filatondi was a member of the Italian Artistic Swimming Elite Squad and is currently head of the coaches for the Youth National British Squash uh, Squad in, in, in the UK. She is a PhD candidate at London Met and founder of the, of the Yundin Aquatic Theatre, an international company of artistic swimmers with the purpose of expanding this practice within the context of contemporary performance. So Francesca is going to give us an overview of her practice um, and particularly as, as it's situated within her doctoral framing. And then we'll come back to this to the to draw these threads of expanded notions of performance and performativity. Thank you, Francesca. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear. There's a little bit of, of noise, but I think it's it's uh, it's uh, uh, it, it'll be fine. <laughs> OK, so anyway, it's good that you can hear me. <laughs> so um, I am uploading the, the presentations. So as um, as Jacek has introduced me, so I'm a uh, next member of the Italian national team, Elite Squad, and now I'm coaching uh, the the youth squad of the UK. So I have 38 years of experience in artistic swimming, and I saw really the evolution of the sport. But starting from the beginning, so I started this research. And the title of my research is Creative, Interpretive and Performing Dynamics in Artistic Swimming. I think you can see the slides on the on your screen now. Can you confirm that you can yes, see this? Yes, we can see them. OK, perfect. So as the title suggests, the purpose of my research is to expand the creative, interpretative, originality and choreographic potential of artistic swimming within 
performing arts subjects by exploring the bodily expression in water and underwater with my research using contemporary methods. So the idea comes from the very medium of artistic swimming, so water, that is not, not, not only the scenographic context of my research and of this, uh, of this sport, but it's also a somatic vector in my case, so an emotional vector, a promoter of emotions that can be explored through contemporary techniques and contemporary movements. So as I have already said, I'm an ex-member of the Italian national team, so and I am an athlete, I am a swimmer, and at the same time, I am a coach. I have 34 years of experience as a coach of international level. And in these years, I, can, I saw the affirmation of artistic swimming as a high competitive Olympic sport on one hand. On the other hand, I would like to, tr to track, to trace a little bit the history of artistic swimming. It started as uh, known as water ballads, then it was proposed as scientific swimming, ornamental, ornamental swimming, synchronized swimming for a long time, and uh, in 2017 it was rewarded in artistic swimming. So with this rewarding, we can really appreciate a sort of evolution of perception of artistic swimming in terms of bodily perception on one side and on the other side of artistic perception. So definitely my research wants to expand this artistry of the swimmer, this originality of the swimmers that beyond being kinesthetic intelligent machines to use a quotation, they have a unique side, an original side that can emerge thanks to exercises, thanks to task through a somatic approach on one side and contemporary methods on the other side. And I will deep into the details of this task after, during, during this presentation. So starting with the the question of my research. So my, my research stems from these questions. How to frame an original performance text that engages with contemporaneity in water and underwater? How to expand the expressive bodily potential in response to the current bodily perception of artistic swimmer as kinesthetic intelligent machines? And I would like here to add also the other limiting images of artistic swimmer that everybody in the 50s we know Esther Williams. So we have the Hollywood legacy that dictated the supremacy of these women, of these stereotyped women. And then to pass to the third question, how might this practice provide new insights into artistic swimming, thus blueprinting a future development in the sector? So in order to respond to these questions, in 2020, I founded a company named Yundin Aquatic Theatre. And the purpose of this company is to welcome not only talented artistic swimmer, but above all, club swimmers and university swimmers, university students who want to expand their originality, their choreographic potentials using an outreach educational program on one side or a choreographic program on the other side, according to their experience and their abilities, according to their background. So going inside into the overview of the research, the purpose is to develop a creative training and choreographic method for artistic swimming. The method I am developing is divided into a training method and the training method is also divided into spheres of intervention and then a choreographic method that is still in experimental phase. The results of this research will be displayed in a production entitled Yundin. So Yundin is a fairy tale written by Friedrich de la Mazzoque and what I am doing is reinterpret this fairy tale in a contemporary way. The discussion about what will emerge from this anthological display of Yundin will be a sensory elaboration and embedded experience considered from the point of view of the performers and the point of view also of the spectators through feedbacks, interviews. So the research is based on a method and the method is called Yundin Aquatic Theatre Method from the name of the company and the name also of this production. And it is divided into a training method, and it is an unfolding process of international between choreographer and performer in water and underwater. And then it also it is also a three-phase emerging process around the somatic. So the method is divided into spheres of intervention interventions. Inside these spheres of interventions, we have an awakening process that passes through the somatic. The three phases, these three awakening process phases divided into somatic awareness around the being. And so the purpose is to expand and to erase concentration and imagination. 
Then the second phase is the somatic movement of elaboration, where the being coincides with the doing, with the purpose of investigating, being curious, and find new shapes and movements. And then all these shapes and movements will collide inside this somatic staging with the purpose of transfer these shapes and movements inside a contemporary context that will be evoked and inspired by the performers through their associations, their lateral thinkings, their um, souvenirs and histories, personal histories and backgrounds. The training, the, math, the Union Aquatic Theatre method, sorry, is also a choreographic method. For instance, for, for at the moment it's in experimental phase, but it will be a combination of the thematic exercises that we can find in the three spheres of intervention. It will be also a point of view seen from the point of view of the performers and their shared experiences, and it will be also seen inside the contemporary context. So the research, this will be the macro, the macro spheres, the macro section of my research will be the training method on one hand, the choreographic method on the other, and then a special section will be dedicated to the production of Yundin. So, going into the details of the method, the method is divided into spheres of interventions. The first sphere is called underwater somatic, the second one is watery landscapes, and the third one is watery moods. Inside the, the underwater somatic, the purpose is to release swimmers from standard shapes and movements. So, here I'm using experimental immersions, I'm using flowing exercises, I'm using exercises with tempo inserted in an interpretative context. In the second sphere, water landscapes, the purpose is to break standard trajectories and exploring new topography. So here I'm working with patterns, patterns within, within the patterns, I'm making them explode, implode, using one performer together with the group or one performer with the scenario, with the architectures. And then we pass to the third sphere, so the water removes, with the purpose of meeting diverse living experience and backgrounds. So here, the purpose is to inspect the emotional side of the performers by inspiring them, by triggering them the, their originality through documentaries, through images, voices, sounds, music, costumes, and all they're related to their personal stories, their personal backgrounds, and their personal lateral thinking again. Inside these three spheres of interventions, I have found out, find out some engagements, some commitments, and they are then reproduced inside tasks. So inside the underwater somatic, the three engagements, the three commitments are tempo, direction, and flow. So the tempo here, I am considering all the speed of the movements, but inside an interpretative context. So the energy of the movement also. The direction is the tension and intention of the movement. So the direct gesture, the indirect gestures, curves, gestures, linear gestures. In the flow, I'm talking about the reaction of the movement, but considering all the movements that are sustained by another performers or are um, sustained or also found the resistance of waters. Here I'm also engaging all the senses and exclusion of senses like exercises with eyes closed, for instance. Inside the watery landscape, the three engagements are the trajectories, relationships and frameworks. So here I'm talking about action. The trajectories are the direction of the action that can be upwards, downwards, backwards, forwards. Relationships is the action of a performer of the group uh, in response vis-a-vis -vis to another performer, to the scenario and to uh, the architecture. In the frameworks, I'm talking about the shapes and movements that can emerge from uh, repeti repetitive exercise, mirror exercise, together with performers or the groups. In water subjects, and this is the most uh, introspective part, the three engagements are identity, growth and diversity. In identity, this task encompasses memory explorations and shared experiences of the performers. In the growth, here it entails with games, improvisations, and playing with what is happening on the scene, on the liquid scene in this case. And the diversity is concerns all the interaction with the diverse backgrounds in terms of ethnicity, age, uh, bodily or perception, and on the other hand, also the nature tangibility. 
So I'm talking about what COVID has brought about. So COVID was can be considered also our way towards a new imprinting of synchronized swimming in living waters. And so I would like to explore the body relationship with water and with nature. To go on with this research, so rehearsal are divided into preparatory exercises on land, but also in water. And I'm talking about ritual water exercises, and I would like later to explain what I mean for ritual water exercises. And then the second part of the rehearsal would be around the spheres of intervention. So one of the tasks taken from the sphere of intervention, everything will be anticipated by a briefing. So I would like to talk to the to the swimmers. Uh, swimmers are explained what they are doing in water. And then the, there is this task taken from the three spheres that passes through this awakening process of somatic awareness, somatic movement elaboration, and somatic staging. To go to the final feedback, 15 minutes of feedback with the performers about what they have felt, about what are they are, they are their, what they have as perception in their body. To go to the ritual water exercises. For ritual water exercises, I intend, I mean, all the exercises in order to expand and explore the technical, physical and psychological areas in order to warm up the body, to prevent injuries, but also to simulate body and mind into a collaborative and inflex studies. I have divided these ritualized exercises into spheres, again, into axes, six axes. The first axis is called amplitude, and here I'm talking about the extension of the movement, Rapidity is the expression of the energy. The exactitude is the precision of the movement even after exhaustive repetitions. Body Im imaginary has something to do with the body responsibility. In It is the body capacity of reproduce an image and reproduce in his, uh, in his expression, his bodily expression, the image I'm giving them, the image that can be also an input, an outside input. Combination is the reprocessing of exercises belonging to different domains and putting them together and recombine together. And the reaction is that the proprioceptor reaction of what is happening on the stage. For instance, working also with obstacles in water, so with eyes closed again, as I have already said, to rate rate what I have already said. So here I'm exposing three cases. The three cases are taken from each of the spheres of intervention. And I've given also specific le lexics to this exercise, to this task. For the underwater somatic, I've taken this exercise called the pilot fish. And again, I want to say that all these tasks pass through an awakening process of awareness, you know, to release resistance, integrate rhythm and frequency of movement, be connected with what is happening on this on the scene and enjoy this journey. Then the second phase is the elaboration. So elaboration of the movement. So favors new movements, be curious, investigate shapes and then the stage where we adapt, we reinterpret what we have investigated in a contemporary context. Considering this exercise, this specific exercise that belongs to the underwater somatic, we are working above all underwater and on the surface in a flowing state. And the task deals with the sequence of movement to be executed in pair with one of the two is the receiver of the movement, it favors the movement, and, and the other one is the conductor, is the leader. Then I have another case, and this second case, uh, it's something to, it has something to do with uh, the patterns, with patterns and with the shapes that we can create in combining patterns in different ways and the directions inside these patterns. So the t this task envisages taking a basic action like spinning, for instance, a, bas a basic action, and ex execute it in different dimensions, underwater, upwards, downwards, in an horizontal or vertical transversal line. And again, it passes through these three phases of awakening process. To go to the final spheres, for these spheres, I have, I have decided to use this exercise called the butterfly fish that I consider one of the success of this research. This experiment, this task was done with a mature swimmer and uh, the purpose was to consider a cycle of movements embedding a personal and indirect analysis of life experience. I, I asked this woman to, to think about 
her personal life, but also to think about life of someone else. And she decided to talk, to talk about herself. The questions in order to lead this choreography, her choreography, was, is there a light motif in your life? Is your life linear or circular? Where do you look for relationships? And as we can see in the link that I'm going to, to share you in order to see this video, because uh, it deserves to be seen this video, we can really see in how this choreography transcends the standard movement of artistic swimming and becomes really a moment of, of self-discovery and intimacy. So I would like to, to give you this, the link, but just to conclude with the choreographic method. Again, it's an experimental phase and to reiterate what I've already said, it's the combination of these, these uh, tasks taken from the three spheres of intervention. It will be taken from the point of view of the performers and it will be seen inside a contemporary context. So I want to conclude with these three links. So the first links I've put here is, um, is a video about the journey of this Yundin Aquatic Theatre Company. And this video was taken during the lockdown and the partial lockdown. So sometimes we were obliged to train ourselves in very difficult and uncomfortable situations like in underground car park, under the storms. So it was very tough. It was very difficult to train. Anyway, we, we were able to find other ways to explore the somatic side of the performers. And the second video, this transdisciplinary approach where I'm using exercises also taken from theater and dance, contemporary dance movement. We are uh, composing a choreography that was given at home. So these women were at home, they had a task and they thought about this task and then they reproduce this movement, these shapes, and these little choreographies that was put together in a compositional exercise. And then I would like you to, to, to see this last video that was connected with the butterfly fish task. And uh, here, really, you can appreciate the evolution of, of artistic swimming in my research as a new way to discover ourselves, to find this originality and to find out really also the, peculi the body peculiar peculiarity of the swimmers and their characters, their expressions, their, their questionings. And here in this choreography, everything is condensed. So I would like to thank you. And uh, if you have any questions, I would like to stay here on this link just to, to give you the possibility to, to write it down if you want to see it, as we cannot use the chat, I think. Um, I think, you know, uh, uh, Francesca, we might, I'm, I'm constantly conscious of time, but I'd love to see if you could share, uh, if we could try and share, maybe Hannah can help us here, um, mm -hmm. to share maybe the one of the videos. I wonder whether we could share the, uh, the third one. Yeah, uh, as, is that is that something we can do um, if um, if you've got it um, if uh, Francesca if you've got the the link uh, uh, with you you should be able to share it. Okay. Um, shall we try it? Yes, I will try it. Hmm. So oh, I think you should be able to use the um, I think you should be able to use the chat. So if you want to just uh, just copy it to the chat, then I can I can okay, try I, and see whether I can share it. I try. We'll see this, and as you do this, uh, let me just um, uh, kind of uh, start to to bring some of the ideas together. Well, first of all, uh, to say how um, exciting it is for us to see this incredibly diverse range of um, of researchers that we are championing within our school. And this idea that research is, is led through practice is something that's very, very important for, uh, for us and, and through uh, many of our, of our doctoral students. Um, uh, let me, uh, Francesca, did you have any, any, uh, any luck with, the, with, the, with uh, putting the link on, on the chat? I have put the link on the chat so you can ah, okay. see the link. Let me just, uh, sorry everybody for, thank you for bearing with me. Ah, no, I'm afraid. <laughs> no, it's not working. <laughs> uh, yes, as, as we suspected. But certainly what we will do is, um, is use the, um, the opportunity uh, to, um, to uh, we will definitely make sure that we can, these, these links can be, 
uh, can be um, accessed by by our audience. I just wanted to see whether I wonder maybe Francesca, if you want to uh, send me the link by by email no. now, uh, whilst yeah. we continue the conversation, and uh, maybe we can we can try that. Maybe just the last link we may be yes. able to to show. Um, but let me just uh, kind of put these these ideas together, and if I can just bring back um, uh, uh, Mechtild as as Francesca is. is uh, um, is uh, uh, looking for uh, sending me the link. Uh, there is, a new, and obviously, there is no doubt that the two the two topics are completely uh, contrasting. But there is also something that I find quite interesting here, because in the in the potential similarities, um, because um, in in however contrasting they are, there is an interesting idea of using performativity against a concept that is traditionally seen as quite static. So in the case of of the of course of of your research uh, method, there's the deal with the monument. The monument we often have, you know, the, the sort of broad perception of a monument as something that is intentionally static, never changing, etc. And in the case of Francesca's um, uh, work, there is this idea, of course, of the of the institutional sport that in itself often is perceived as being um, as being uh, you know uh, static in its own rules and its own uh, ideas and in and in both cases we're using the concept of performativity you know of uh, and uh, uh, contemporary performance and performativity as as ways to to kind of uh, rejig these um, these uh, fixed ideas. Um, is that um, is there something there that we can we or, or which we can talk about? Mechta, and then I'll come back to Francesca. Francesca, in the meantime, have you have you uh, sent me that thing? Yes. yes. Okay, brilliant. And then I'll come back to you in a second. Mm -hmm. I actually have a, a question. I think for, for Francesca, what a fascinating topic, uh, which I know nothing about. Right. So that's a <laughs> <laughs> but um, I'm thinking about the power of um, embodiment. So yes, performativity has to do with the body, right? But the power mm. of embodiment in um, in the in the activities and how much of that embodiment is related to conventions, pushing those conventions. Uh, so I think I'm just interested in 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 that in in how she in, you know sees embodiment in her. In the in the equation at the power of mm. Francesca. It's a, yeah, the power of embodiment. Um, yeah. Okay. So. Thanks for uh, the talk, by the way. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that in water, the fact that the water is uh, is flowing, and um, always our body is made of water, so uh, we can find this. Um, sort of uh, a reconstruction of ancient memories also with water and with the body. So I, I find in this way this embodiment with water and uh, with my research in this, this thematic. Brilliant. Yeah, I almost used the word history then I thought, no, stop asking everyone about history, but you brought it up yourself. So thank you for that. <laughs> And, and there is something very symbolic, Francesca, with this idea of water and uh, water as an environment in its own right, where um, that the the body of the performer. Uh, there is something um, again in in trying to to uh, to capture a potential similarity in again very contrasting topics. But there is something very interesting with uh, from the uh, the uh, example that that Mechtel mentioned about Bali export. Um, uh, use of her own body uh, as a way to uh, symbolically um, uh, uh, kind of um, uh, subvert uh, a space, and there is something quite interesting there in the use of the of um, of the uh, the performer and the relationship with water. And um, can you tell us a little bit, Francesca, about the the sort of symbolic notion of of water as an environment? So water. Water. Um, what I am. What I am exploring is the fact that water. I'm talking about again the memories of water. So water. Water is not. It's something live in. So even the fact that I want to to give to produce my my performance in living water is the fact that I, I don't want to use a static a stagnant a stagnatic water, mm -hmm. but using this living living water that we can find just outside in nature, just to 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 extract also to 
to, to drag also from ourselves and the body inside the water, this, uh, this unison, this, unis, this unison body, this unison memory that comes together and both are lively. So our body, our water inside and that body and the, the water of nature is lively. So in, in, this, in this unison, in this marriage, I'm, I'm working and try to find this fluidity also of the body, of our body and ourselves. And it's interesting that we, we talked before about the public space versus the private space. And of course, it's interesting that through COVID, you then um, are developing this work. Um, the video that we're going to show you in a second is obviously in, in a swimming pool. But the but what's interesting is that the, the new the new experiments you've done are in uh, in lakes, in in other environments that are, that are public in that sense. Yeah. And so there's an interesting <laughs> kind of parallel there between the private and the public space, which is really interesting. And so I'm going to show this this a uh, short video one of the, of of Francesca's videos um and and so let me see if, if that that works. um we should be able to uh, to see can i just ch check with Francesca can you see the, the i can no i cannot see i can't see this I, yes now now yes yes it's okay oh no yes okay brilliant so i'm going to play it now and hopefully the video will play Sorry, my computer's giving me some problems. Oh, sorry. What? Well, I can also explain. Yes, key, do do please. What is happening because it's a little bit uh, frozen. So, so what is different from artistic swimming is the fact that we we have investigated all the underwater that is not common in artistic swimming, and the fact to find our body immersed in water, in this liquid and with silence uh, around us, it permits this girl, this woman, to. To find a way to describe her life, her personal life, and the description she wants to give, she has this uh, this pillar, and uh, this pillar represents life. So she's she finds herself like sort of struggling to find her way back, and so she's struggling with life. But in the end, she has to accept that the life is there. Is it? There for herself, so she has to come outside and be in a butterfly. That's real the name of this. That's why she come outside. Like a sort of struggle. Definitely, I mean it's very evocative. This this um, this image. I know that the that the when we play videos on on Teams, it's always a little bit tricky with the quality of the video. But it, there's something really really powerful about that. And and I think it's interesting again going back to that that uh, um, that uh, idea of going from um, from the the uh, uh, above the water level to under underwater is another kind of strange metaphor of of private and and public. Um, we got a question. Yes, please. So I'm not sure. Yes, like, is it me? Um, yes, yes. I, uh, hi. Hi. Um, I'm for some reason under my son's name, Nicola. Yes, um, I, it did uh, very sorry. <laughs> my name is Tanya, Tanya Scholz from Stockholm. And I just wanted to say hello to Francesca because we have had some contacts and I because I, I'm not visible, but my name, I want to say hello. Also, I'm a monument scholar who just came to synchronize swimming two years ago, not being a sportive person. So for me, this night is, of course, a <laughs> revelation. Um, it's incredible, brought uh, Mechtel together with um, artistic swimming. And honestly, 
I just did this because I love water. I feel very comfortable in water. But if anyone has ever showed me any video of what synchronized swimming traditionally is, I mean, I would never start it. And every time I'm in the water, I just think, why could it not be exactly like I now saw in the video? So if your project is successful, I think you will start a movement. Um, it is such a fantastic project and I just congratulate you and I just hope that we can contribute anything in Stockholm. We are very eager and keen um, to help you. Uh, I have no intelligent comment to make, just that I'm thanked both um, for these wonderful presentations. And, and Tanya, you are a perfect link <laughs> for today. Yes. And absolutely. And I should say Tanya's research is absolutely, we, we are very much looking forward to hosting Tanya's research uh, on, on the subject of, of, um, of uh, performative monuments as well. And the um, and it's really interesting. And, uh, and this adds another, yet another international dimension to today because now we got a link to Stockholm as well. So oops, I'm just going to to conclude um, just getting to. Oh, yes, we got another question. Evelyn. Hi, Evelyn. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes, you can. Yes, we can. Thank you for two really inspirational presentations. It was really great and so different. And yet I'm drawn by something which for me really links them and which is they're both um, what I would call an undoing of the supremacy of verticality. Mm -hmm. And how important that is now in, in terms of undoing individual individualism and um, well, you know, all of that stuff. But because as a choreographer and I've just written a book on falling. And for me, both of your presentations really um, look at how the human body, the human body can undo the sense of the upright and the upright obviously in Western culture represents supremacy. So thank you for making links to my own research. That was really, really useful. Thank you. And it's so interesting, isn't it, this idea of the verticality, because Mechtel, that, that is such a, a classic example of our notion of the monument. It's vertical, it's big, there's all, all those connotations and this idea. And, and of course, again, the, the um, image of Valley Export kind of going against that into the ground and is so, so, um, so evocative and so, so dense. Uh, Mechtel, any points on that? That was, uh, that was such a brilliant comment. Emmeline, thank you so much. I'm also, your book is on my to-do list. Is, is it out already? Yes, it is. We, and we'd love, by the way, to do, to host another, another launch for, for Emmeline's books because it's, it's, um, it's a brilliant topic within our, um, within the, this, this research. So we're getting more and more links. Uh, yes, in no, this the... is really, this is really brilliant and that fits so <laughs> <laughs> nicely together and is really part of my interest. So thank you. <laughs> Brilliant. Excellent. Well, I think we're getting to the end of this. So thank you so much for joining. I should say also that we are recording the, all these um, these uh, presentations because as often, often because a lot of our audiences come literally from all, all over the world. So so um, a lot of people ask us if we can keep the recording. And so the recordings are available in on the website. If you look at past events, you will always see the recording, which is also good because then you see also the links, for instance, to Francesca's videos. I should say as as Francesca's supervisor, how proud I am of of uh, you know Francesca's uh, present you know presentation skills. Of course, they're incredible practice, but also the way that now you are communicating the practice in this uh, in this in the complexity of it is really um, it's it's something that makes me so proud. And of course, I'm incredibly proud of Mechtel being involved in our uh, both in our research center and also in our on our MA. And it's uh, you know it's just uh, I'm so excited about that. So thank you so. So much everyone. I just wanted to to um, just uh, remind everyone that, that we have some forthcoming um, events within uh, within Creature, which will continue this thread of of performance, uh, monuments, and public spaces. And then just um, uh, remind everybody that the next ones will be on uh, the 17th of March. We'll have um, we'll have uh, two two events. In fact, we've got. Um, 
sorry, 17th of March, we've got multicultural art institutions at the crossroads pressing challenges. That's led by uh, by Professor Wesley Ling. And then on the 18th of March, on our normal Thursday uh, spot, but this would be on the lunchtime uh, slot. There's always either lunchtime or, or evening, and that's Kitchen Table Monumentalism um, by Galia and Pill Collective. So uh, plenty of things happening. Do check our website, please. And thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'm so excited by the diversity of the, of the subjects we cover. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye.